Good evening. Welcome to Vibin' with Ashley Live. I'm your host, Ashley Live, and this is episode 226 of my show. This next guest, I am so excited to welcome him back to this stage. The first time Mike was on this show was episode 38, which was January 2021. So Mike has long due to come back on the show because he has so much to talk about. But let me introduce you to my next guest, singer, songwriter, and pianist, the one, the only, Mike Jarrell. Mike's musical journey includes a memorable four-chair turn on season 18 of NBC's The Voice and a remarkable stint as the lead vocalist for Tower of Power. With his soulful voice and magnetic performances, he continues to inspire audiences across the globe, fueling a universal love for the power of music. Mike is in the house and let's get this party started. Mike! Ashley, how are you? I'm doing well, Mike, how are you? I'm so good and so very happy to be here. Oh, I'm so very excited to welcome you back to the show. As I said in my intro and I told you earlier, this is the second time on my show. And Mike, you've been doing so much in these past couple years. And I'm so very gra grateful that you're back on the show because then we can talk all about it. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here again. And like I said, it's a full circle moment for me. Yeah, of course. So you just finished a two year stint as the lead singer of Tower of Power, how did this opportunity come about for you? Well, it's interesting because um, the drummer for the band, the legendary drummer, David Garibaldi, mm -hmm. uh, scoped me out on YouTube. He saw my audition on The Voice and he sent it to his fellow band members and eventually sent me an email. He was like, hey, Mike, uh, this is David Garibaldi the drummer for Tower of Power. We're auditioning singers, and we're wondering if you're interested in auditioning. Immediately, I thought it was spam. Like, I was like, this is fake. Like, this is yeah. not real. Um, and I called one of my friends. He's a musical mentor of mine, uh, Pat Patton, out of Noonan, Georgia. And he's done, so we've done a lot of work together. And so I called him because he's a huge Tower fan. And I was like, Pat, this guy named David Garibaldi just sent me a message about auditioning for the band. Uh, do you think it's real? He was like, bro, like it's absolutely real. If you're interested, do it, pursue it. And so uh, long story short, I messaged him back. I sent an email back and uh, things went from there. I got in contact with Emilio. Uh, Emilio and I started uh, trading communication and we, set, we started moving forward. He sent me a song list that was about 10, I think it was 10 to 12 songs. And uh, he's like, just prepare these and we're gonna set you up an audition. We'll come out, you do the audition and then we'll, we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it took, it actually took about a year. Um, about a year, maybe a few months before I even uh, had the opportunity to audition. Um, I was very diligent in my communication with Emilio and with David uh, in regards to chasing this opportunity. I wanted to pursue it because it was something that I was interested in. I knew Tower of Power. I used to sing their music. I sang so very hard to go. Uh, yeah. I think this time it's real uh, with another cover band that I performed with in um, Columbus by the name of River City Horns. Mm -hmm. And we did that. And so like all of it was so surreal um, leading up to it. But once everything got in motion, I went out and did the audition and uh, they called me, I think it was like two to three hours after my audition and say, Mike, we want you to come back and do another, like maybe basically a call back. We want to call you back and, and have you sing some more. Yeah. And uh, I call, I had to call my principal and I was like, hey, um, I didn't know, I wasn't sure how to explain it. I was like, I got to stay another day or two to do another audition with these guys. And, you know, he gave me his blessing. He was like, go ahead, do what you got to do. Uh, we'll see you when you get back, Mr. Johnson. And I went and did that. And I think uh, Christmas Day or maybe the day before Christmas, Emilio called me. And he said, I just want to be, I want to give you an early Christmas present. 
I'll let you know that you have earned the position as the lead singer for Tower of Power. And then boom, <laughs> it was there. Uh, it was working. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. And, and to know that you look up to those guys and you've sung their songs, right? And to know that the drummer saw your your audition from The Voice. I think that is so amazing because you were on The Voice season 18 and mm -hmm. you never know once you hit that stage who's going to see those videos, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. You just you don't know. It's a it's something that it's a stage that, and a platform that is just distributed worldwide. You don't yeah. you just you have no clue who's looking. And um, thankfully it made me in that position uh, yeah. just as, a, as an, an extra step in my music career. Yeah. And especially a Christmas gift, because, right, like the holiday season is so stressful to begin with. You're buying gifts. You're with your family. You're like you're doing all this crazy stuff. And that I can only imagine how that felt when when you knew in the moment, like talk to us about hearing that. It it, it I, I think I was already um, I was already in, in in a very relaxed, calm state. Um, but when I received that news, I think my <laughs> my happy meter went through the roof. I got so giddy, like I was I was just filled with joy. I wanted to run up and down the hall. I wanted to scream. Like I I just I really wanted to lose control. If I be completely honest, yeah. I wanted to lose control and just. You know, I don't know if uh, if you if you know what it feels like to just be overcome with excitement like that, mm -hmm. and um, just to have that call and to have that confirmation that you know the work that I put in. Um, I went into the audition. I memorized every song. Um, I made sure that when I showed up to the audition that um, I was prepared. Um, I practiced every day before I even knew when the audition was. I did it what I call an hour of tower. And I was in my kitchen and I would sing the songs. I would be belting them out for an hour every day after work. I would teach for eight hours and then come home and sing for an hour and a half and then go to sleep with the music playing and then wake up, go to work with the music playing and to see it all come full circle. Everything, it just went, it just came into fruition for me. and. It was rewarding to see that the hard work was paying off, you know. Um, and that's what we as musicians and artists, that's what we ultimate, that's one of our ultimate goals is to see that every bit of hard work that we're putting in is paying off. You know, we don't want to feel like we're working in vain or putting in all this work in vain. But all of a sudden, you know, well, not all of a sudden, but it seemed seemingly all of a sudden it pays off. And, um, that's what it was. It was just like I was. I was so excited. I was filled with joy. I wanted to jump up and down. I just. I wanted to go buy pizza, eat ice cream, celebrate, <laughs> get a cake. You know, <laughs> I want to do all of that. And um, so I, you know, it was just something special for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for talking about the preparation and the hard work that goes into that, right? Because you were of music teacher you were with your children all the time and then you come back to your house and you're singing and you're practicing and you have the music playing in your headphones and that takes such a level of dedication right and you're having fun with it and i can only imagine what those nights were like for you where you're singing and you're dancing in your house and then to get that call yeah that it all came together you're just like okay well now i can actually be on stages across the world mm -hmm. doing this by mm -hmm. somebody, because someone in the band believed in me and saw me. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. 100%. It was, it was, like I said, one of the, it was a full circle moment because I had already been covering two of the songs and right. like I said, to actually come home. Like I, I had, at one point, I was tired of listening to the music. Like I was like, I'm done. Like I want to play something else. Next station. I want to find another artist. But yeah. all that hard work paid off, and uh, that work wasn't done in vain. And um, so, like I said, super excited that I just had the opportunity to be with this legendary group, tour all over the world, be on all these amazing stages, yeah. um, meet 
so many different people and um, hone in on my craft and, uh, you know, just, and it was a continuation, somewhat of an extension of what I was already doing. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was amazing. Full circle moment all the way yeah. around. Yeah. I love what you said about it being an extension of what you were doing. Cause I saw you perform with tower of power, Mike, yes. and seriously, you lit up the stage. You worked every inch of that stage. You're playing piano, you're dancing, you're engaging the crowd. There is just a level of energy and professionalism and just fun you're having. And it just like, you were having so much fun up there. And it just, it shows, like it shows how passionate you are about your craft. Yeah, yeah. We got, we got rained out on that gig too. We did. <laughs> We got I, mean, I don't know if you you were a little wet, but you were on stage. I was wet from sweat, but you guys were wet from the rain. Like I was just pouring sweat by the time because it got so humid, like all of a sudden, and yeah. we just saw rain and the rain started going sideways for a minute. And yep. um, you know, we had to kind of cover up and the woodwinds, they had to kind of move back, microphones, yeah. of course. But yeah, yeah, it does. It takes a lot of energy. Uh, and you know, it's, it's Tower of Power is a freight train. They yeah. are, it's a freight train of just, it's a wall of sound that's behind you and it's pushing for 90 minutes. And, and they don't stop. Like, they it's, don't. It's, <laughs> so talk to me, because two years is a very long time to be with them. Talk to me mm -hmm. about like any memorable moments or standout performances or specific performances or times on tour that you had with them that really like, stand out to you um i think one of my most memorable moments i have so many of them i know you do <laughs> one of them <laughs> i remember i forget what city we were in but i remember sitting standing on stage and looking out in the audience and seeing stephen king sitting there oh wow i'm like i, I, was, I was probably in the middle of uh i think i think i was singing only so much oil in the ground and um that song, if you know that song, it's got like four verses and it's really, really, really wordy. And I want to say I almost got tripped up on my verses, on my words, because I was like, wait, is that Stephen King <laughs> in, in the audience right here? And uh, after the show, he came back, uh, he kicked it with the band and he, he was a fan of me and I took a picture with him. That was great. Um, I had an opportunity to perform at Red Rocks uh, with the symphony. Wow. And um, for every uh, musician, artist, that's one of the premier stages in, in the entire world. Like if, if, if you want to play a stage, Red Rocks is on that list. Mm -hmm. um, we did a European run, um, Jazz and Marciac, a Marciac. Um, we did the Love Supreme Jazz Festival uh, in um, in Europe as well. I forget what vicinity of Europe we were in when we did that. Um, playing uh, the Stern Grove Festival was really, really interesting. Um, we were kind of like in this, I want to call it uh, a pit of grass and trees, but it was a very hilly type of terrain. Mm -hmm. um, and you just, I, I'm sitting on stage and I look up and there, there, there's a sea of people. I mean, just as far as the eye can see. Uh, and the same thing uh, for, we just did, a, we did another festival in Europe. I told you there were a lot of them. I, I'm losing count. <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> so many. Uh, I remember looking at, I forget, maybe that was Love Supreme. Um, there's a, there, there was a festival and I, I looked out into the sea of people and it was just endless people um mm -hmm. being on stage with people such as jeffrey osborne or the same stage as um Sam samara joy um who's a new and up-and-coming jazz artist she won plenty of awards this past year um she's very talented if if you are a jazz fan if you love classic jazz standards and pure vocals samara joy i'm talking about top tier um, type of performer. Uh, Snarky Puppy, we were on the same stage as those guys. Uh, of course, The Temptations shared the stage with them. Uh, Beach Boys. Um, uh, I'm running out of names, but. <laughs> Too many. 
<laughs> too, too many to remember and to recall. Uh, yeah. Too short rapper. He was there in Stern Grove with us. That was really fun. Uh, I remember looking over at Stern Grove and I was singing and I, I, I saw him to the side of the stage. Like, you know, and I tell this funny story about how um, initially I asked to take a picture with him when we were backstage and he was looking at me like, who is this guy? Uh, <laughs> right, take this picture with me real quick. And I snapped the picture. And 15 minutes later, you know, it kind of dawned on him. He was like, he may have been a performer, I feel like. And so I looked over to the side and Too Short was over there. Like he was really digging the vibe. Yeah. And so he's a Bay Area rapper for everybody that knows Bay Area rappers, Too Short is kind of, he's legendary, honestly. Yeah. Um, I sang at the um, uh, the Las Vegas Raiders, one of their football games. We did the Star Spangled Banner there, which is where I get <laughs> <laughs> this jersey. <laughs> it's flipped. Um, it's flipped. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's one of them. I was like, it's, it's somewhere here somewhere. It's but, right uh, above. It's right above the keys, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's right above the keys. <laughs> Um, we did. I did the uh, Las Vegas Raiders game, and I got an opportunity to uh, hang in a suite with Charles Woodson, uh, Hall of Famer Charles Woodson, Tim Brown, mm -hmm. um, Michael Haynes, and all these guys. We were just sitting up there having amazing food in a suite, and they were playing the Las Vegas. Uh, no, Las Vegas was playing. I want to say they were playing the Rams, and thankfully the Raiders won that game. Surprise. <laughs> because the Raiders were playing bad that year. It played terribly. Um, but, I mean, there's a, there are a slew of memorable moments that I could recall um, just going back, you know. Um, but, yeah, so many symphony orchestra gigs. And um, I, I, <laughs> Hawaii was amazing. We do, we do the uh, Blue Note, and we've done that. That was a... That was a that was a lesson uh, when we do when we've done the blue note um that whole experience that that was a lesson for me uh, because because of the way they book their shows mm -hmm. um but it was still an amazing moment we were in paradise like the most isolated place you could think to be on the world water sand in between your toes sun and beach great food okay anything you can think of uh a good time yeah yeah and i feel like like i said before i feel like we could go for like three hours and just talk about all these memorable moments because there are <laughs> so many and they must go by so fast when you're on tour because right you're traveling on a bus on a plane mm -hmm. you're you know what i mean like and then it's time zone difference and then it's different crowds and different peoples and sound check and and the the thing about your stage show is it's so physical like you're singing but like you're dancing and you're engaging and it's like like you said earlier you were sweating i'm i'm sure you sweat 10 minutes into your performance because you're just all over the stage easily easily i'm burning i'm i am just losing water weight yeah it. i'm like right now i'm thinking about it and i'm, I'm just I'm losing <laughs> water weight just thinking about it but it's true. Like the first 10 minutes of the show, we are yeah. Um, we are a freight train out the gate. And it's, mm -hmm. it's really no, it's really no pause in it. Like we we go from the time we hit the stage until the time we walk off. Yeah. And um and I and I I say we are tower of power, and then we come back on and we do two more songs. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it it's definitely an experience, a, a very physical, um, it's a learning experience. Um, you learn as you go, mm -hmm. um, you adapt, you adjust as you go and, um, you learn lessons, like I said, and, uh, but you enjoy it at the same time because it's, it's, this is, it's what I love to do. It's, I, I, I tell people all the time, it's the life that chose me. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's something that I haven't been able to run from. Mm -hmm. I've tried, I've done, pretty much anything that I can think of um, in a musical sense. And mm -hmm. the stage just keeps calling me and pulling me back. It's like, nope, you can't go anywhere. It's, this is this is you, man. Yeah. And so, um, I'm thankful for it. I'm super blessed to uh, even have and be, be afforded these opportunities mm -hmm. um, to do what I love. 
Yeah, I think that's the ultimate thing that people want in their life is they just want to love what they do because you're on stage, you're having so much fun. You're like, not only am I having fun, I love this. I'm getting mm -hmm. paid to do this. Like, it's got to be kind of wild sometimes that you're like, people are paying me to do this, but I, mm -hmm. I love it so, so, so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 100%. And then you think of all these other random jobs that you've had and you're just like, oh my gosh, I wish I didn't have that job or this job, but I, to do music and know that that's your calling and your passion. And you're just like, this is what I'm here to do. Yes. A hundred percent. And I just have to walk in. Like I have to square my shoulders, hold my head high, walk mm -hmm. into it and accept it. That, you know, that's, that's, it's what it is, you know? Yeah. Um, and of course, we, I work hard to get there. I've worked hard to get there. I put in the work to get there. And when I'm there, it's, it's just it's a surreal moment. And then it becomes reality. Mm -hmm. and, and I have to snap out of it real quick. And then after it's all over and it's said and done, and I'm on, back on the bus, I'm back on the plane. I'm like, wow. I, that, and like you said, those moments go so quickly. Right. You know, it passes by so it, it's such a it's such a fast pace that it's hard to fathom mm -hmm. um, these opportunities that I've come in contact with. It's absolutely amazing. It blows my mind. Yeah, yeah. I'm so happy you were able to have so many incredible experiences like that. Like you said, Red Rocks, Red mm -hmm. Rocks. Uh, it's just such a breathtaking venue. And to to say as a performer, like I performed on that stage is just mm -hmm. a bucket list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Check that one off. <laughs> <laughs> so you were performing with cover bands and then you transitioned to Tower of Power. So can we talk about like challenges you faced during this time of transition? Yeah, it, you know, I think the biggest challenge was, um, I would say, re relieving myself of having complete control. Mm -hmm. um, in my own cover band and my corporate bands, I have the ability to move with the ebb and flow. I can I can go with the flow, pull back. Um, in regards to Tower of Power, it's it's all gas. It's the pedal to the metal. And because the band has been around since 68, mm -hmm. they, they, there's a mold in place. Mm -hmm. um, transitioning from my situation before, I, I was creating the mold. You know, I could... Uh, decide which songs I wanted to sing, which songs I didn't want to sing. Um, or, you know, I could decide if I was going to delegate someone mm -hmm. else to sing something else. Um, because we do, my corporate band, we do a lot of work uh, in the city where we are able to play for uh, corporations such as Aflac. And in those events, I have an opportunity to, you know, hire other people and they come in, I have extra vocalists and they can help carry some of the weight. Mm -hmm. In comparison to Tower Power, I am the, you know, I am the weight. <laughs> you know, I'm exactly. carrying, I'm, I'm putting everybody on my back and we're, yeah. we're, we're, I'm carrying you to the finish line as we push towards, um, towards the end. And um, that was one of the big, that was one of the biggest things um, that I, that I realized. It's just really, really relieving myself of the control realizing mm -hmm. that this is a mold that's already in place mm -hmm. and I have to fit into that mold in comparison to me making the mold and everything else molding around this particular uh, mold that I've already built. Um, another thing was memorizing the songs, um, dealing with fans. <laughs> dealing <laughs> with fans was, it was, it was, it was a hoot. Because um, you know they got they've got fans from '68 that are still like following them, and every time I'm off stage, I've been following this band since 1972. And I've heard every singer, and I've seen so many people come from out of this band, and uh, 
you know, it, it, it's cool to know that people will still rock with me um, just because I'm with the band that they've loved and that they may have, they can, they can remember the first time they heard you're still a young man, or they can remember the first time they heard you're only so much oil. There's only so much oil in the ground yeah. to, to deal with those people. Um, and, and of course people, fans have their preference. And uh, so it was, it was interesting dealing with um, who, who they like the best, you know? Oh, I can only imagine some of those conversations. You're just like, do I really want to hear this right now? <laughs> I just, I dismissed myself. I was like, you know, hey, I'm going to remove myself from this conversation now. <laughs> I'm going to back away slowly. Um, <laughs> uh, hacklers, you know, you deal with those people that are in the, in the audience and they're screaming at you while, while you're singing. And, um, but it's all ammunition for me. It's, it, it all turned into ammo, and um, you know, it, it it pushed me to do things that I may I might have already been on track to do, but it just pushed me further along. It was it was extra it was extra ammunition for me. Like I was like, hey, I need this. This is this is great. I, I can learn from this. And you know, I'm I'm the type of guy where you know I take my situations or I take what's given to me and, you know, basically chew the meat, spit the bone out. Mm -hmm. If it's useful, I keep it. If not, I don't, I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> rest, huge challenge, very huge challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, resting my voice, uh, hygiene in regards to vocal hygiene, hydrating, um, vocal rest, like I said, uh, making sure not to overdo it, like I, I talked about Hawaii, where we do uh, we do five shows in four days, mm -hmm. and um, it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I think Sunday there are two shows, or Saturday there there are two shows, and then Sunday is a show and it's on. And so to sing Tower of Power for ninety minutes, five to six days straight. Mm. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and sometimes two shows in one day. It's like ah. Uh, so that that was because if you listen to the rep, you people that listen to the rep understand the uh, the fatigue that it brings, and they understand the the work that it takes to actually uh, make this train move. And um, <clears throat> memorization was always the thing. They, their words are wonderfully written. Doc and Emilio, uh, Chester. Um, Hubert Tubbs, all those guys that were a part of their uh, lyrics and songwriting, they, it was just impeccable writing skills. I mean, it was great, yeah. but it was difficult to keep track of each lyric. Like yeah. some of them are strophic, where it's the same melody, but different words every time. Um, some of it, it moves in and out. You don't know when the bridge is coming. You don't know when the solo is coming. Yeah. You know, and so it's it forever keeps you in your study book. Mm -hmm. I'm always studying, always going back, listening. I'm always playing it. Um, but yeah, I can I can ramble on and on about those challenges, but they they all made me stronger. They all made me um, a better listener, um, more intentional about the things that I needed to accomplish, and um, all around it just it continues to make me better. Yeah. And I love that you looked at it that way. Cause I feel like in any endeavor in your life, whether personally or professionally, mm -hmm. you need to go through some of these weird moments where you're just like, okay, I don't love this, but like, I'm going to learn something from it. And it's mm -hmm. like when you're going from cover bands where you're in control to being with a force like tower of power, you're like, okay, mm -hmm. this feels uncomfortable. And like, I'll rock with it. Do I like it? I don't know if I like it. And mm -hmm. then, you know, coming outside of it, you're just like, okay, so here's what I learned, here's what I like and what I don't like and what I want to bring into who I am as an artist after this is all done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. So let's talk about season 18 of The Voice. You are a four chair turn. Okay, I remember this blind audition. <laughs> I remember this blind audition. You rocked it and oh, <laughs> God, I just, I loved it so much. So looking back on your journey on The Voice, what, was like the most valuable lesson that you learned professionally as well as personally? You know, um, 
I think the the you know I the first thing that came to mind when you asked that question just now was trust my intuition. Mm-hmm. I learned that if I didn't learn any other lesson on that TV show, the main thing that I took away from that was trust your intuition. Mm-hmm. Um, trust what's living inside of me and don't back away from it. Like don't, don't shy away from what you feel. Um, and, and that was, that was something that I took away from it. And it was, it was an amazing experience. Um, I, I had the awesome pleasure of working with Deborah Bird, rest in God rest her soul. She just passed away recently. And, um, She's just worked with so many, so many different people, such as Fantasia, Jennifer Hudson, Barry Manilow, if if I'm not mistaken, she did a lot of work with him. Mm -hmm. And she was able to speak to me, like she was able to speak to my soul and unlock some things that, you know, maybe maybe I I was aware it was there, Mm -hmm. but... It, it took something to activate it. And whatever it was that she had, she spoke to them. Yeah. And it activated it for me. And, you know, that was her spirit and how she was able to pour into me while preparing for my blind audition. Mm-hmm. It, it, it created so much exponential, astronomical growth in mm-hmm. who I was as a person and who I was as a musician and as an artist and as an instrumentalist. Mm-hmm. Um, just to unlock those things for me. It was absolutely amazing. Um, but trusting my instinct, I took that away. I was like, man, from this moment on, you're going to trust yourself. You're going to trust your instinct. You're going to trust your gut and you're going to go with it. And I had to have that talk with myself in the mirror. I'm, this exact same way I'm pointing in the camera was how I was pointing to myself in the mirror. I said, you're going to do it. You're going to go with it. And you're going to handle this. And you're going to trust yourself. And I took that away. Like, it was great to meet all these amazing artists. Um, I have friends to this day that I still talk to. Uh, We still communicate. And um, it was great for that, Uh, being connected with other artists. And I have other songs that I've actually worked on with uh, one artist in particular from that season. And... um, like I said, lasting uh, lasting communication and relationships with these contestants is it's just been it's been really cool, a mm-hmm. really good life experience there. Yeah, yeah, I'm so happy that you were able to experience all that amazingness on the show. And trusting your intuition is so important. So the song that you're working on with one of the other contestants is that is that gonna be released soon? You know, <laughs> that. I hope so. That that one actually might that one actually might be released soon, um, and I, if I'm not mistaken, um, I want to say that one is close to complete, and um, so that could be on the horizon, um, along with a few other projects that I'm also working on. And yeah. so, um, you know, it's in a vault. It's it's been locked away. It's safe. It's locked up. Got the combination <laughs> lock on it. I only know the combination, and I'm you know. I say this all the time. I'm waiting on the right time, but I I, I do believe that that time is approaching. Oh, that's very exciting. And I know that new music is coming soon. So can you tell us about what's coming up? Well, you know, I can actually. Um, I am, I'm experimenting with a few, I'm experimenting with a few different sounds. Um, Mm -hmm. A few sounds I am kind of digging into, um, and I feel like as artists, we are constantly finding ways to evolve. We're constantly finding ways to express ourselves, and um, I think we're we're also fighting. Uh, we're we're fighting outside noise all the time, yeah. um, but these few pieces that I have, I think they are, they are true to me. Um, working on, still honing in on, on how I want, how I want to be heard. Mm-hmm. So that, that part is, is, has become really important to me. 
And so I'm finding, uh, I'm finding my voice in that. I'm finding my sound. I'm finding my place. And um, for lack of better words, it's on the way. Okay. So stay tuned, guys, because we have some new stuff coming from Mike. And I'm so excited. Are we going to get it in 2024? Now, I would, I would, I would be. <laughs> I mean, should it's April, so. Should I just, you know, just throw it out there. Just, yeah, let's, let's shoot for this year. Let's shoot for the end of this year. We've got some things planned and locked and loaded and ready. Uh, 2024 is going to be a year that you get some new sounds from me. And, uh, or some sounds that you haven't heard. Maybe new to you. New to everyone that's listening, new to everyone that's watching. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you're gonna get some you're gonna get some stuff from me. Oh heck yeah, I'm excited. So okay, so let's go back to the voice because being on a show like that opens up so many doors. I mean, it opened up this opportunity for Tower of Power. So mm -hmm. how did that exposure impact your career and the approach to how you live your life in music now? You know, um it it <laughs> I'm getting caught up on my words. It's actually opened up so many doors. It's created so many different avenues for me at this point. Um, from me being able to have the opportunity to go back to my alma mater, to teach, uh, mm -hmm. even to touring with Tower of Power, and even to now I'm a part of a musical um, stage play that is touring uh, we're on the East Coast now, and um, it's just been something that has just it's it's, it's like a I can't call it a revolving door because that includes a circle. Like it's just different way. I mean, so many different roads, so many different pathways that has been created just from that one song, like the <laughs> one ninety second clip that got all these judges attention the entire world it's it's still it's still showing itself to be strong in my life and um i remember talking to my one of my musical mentors and he told me he said you're going to sing that song for the rest of your life he said just get ready you're singing that song for the rest of your life mm -hmm. it is what it is and honestly i have sang it on every stage since the show and that's been 20 that's been what four years three years three to four years now mm -hmm. every show every stage tower power i sang it every night yeah i sang it on this in the stage play i sang it's a man's world every uh gig that i have that is a corporate show i sing it's a man's world mm -hmm. so i <laughs> i even remember going I visited a, a friend's church and he asked me to come up and sing a song. And he told me, he said, I don't want you to sing anything gospel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On that stage, I sing, it's a man's world. <laughs> so it's like, this song is stretching. It, yeah. it is pulling, it is stretching. And the life just in that opportunity mm -hmm. is continuously opening doors. It's continuously creating new avenues and pathways. and Honestly, I'm sitting at each one of these crossroads figuring out, you know, which is going to be the next one. Like, yeah. where, where do I go? Yeah. <laughs> it's a great problem. And it's not a problem, but it's a great thing to experience. Yeah. And that song, because people know you from that song, mm -hmm. that's why it's so important what your blind audition song is, because some people sometimes someone picks the blind audition song for them and so it's like you want to be known mm -hmm. for a song that you love that you sing very well because we all know some people who go up there and they sing a song that maybe was given to them by somebody else and they fall flat on their face it just they just it doesn't work for them it's so very true that is so very true and you know unfortunately that just tends to be uh in those situations it, it ends up being the nature of the beast right. and, and you know but thankfully for me i had uh, i was given that opportunity and i just yeah. i wanted to put my foot in the door and just knock it all the way down 
Oh, and you did all right. You did. And I love that people are still loving this song, loving your rendition, and you can sing it proudly and just be like, wow, this song has opened up so much for me and it continues to do so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's go back to the blind audition because yes. where we are now, 2024, what advice would you give to young Mike before going out for the blind audition? You know, I would tell myself to breathe. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's so important to just stay still, take some deep breaths, mm -hmm. stand tall, and just breathe. Like, it's, it's okay. Like, me being nervous would not change the outcome one way or the other, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, and I think taking those breaths helps would help to center me. Um, I would understand that, you know, going out, that if I just breathe, take deep breaths, trust, like I said earlier, trust my uh, my intuition, mm -hmm. trust my gut, trust my inner self, and know that it's all in God's hands at this point. Like, it, it, it's out of your hands. You've done the preparation. You just go out, you breathe, and do what you know to do. Right. And at that point, just throw my hands up. I have to surrender to it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I have to surrender to it because, you know, it's nothing that I can do 20, 20 seconds before I go on the stage that's going to help me that if I didn't do earlier or do any other preparation prior to, nothing 20 seconds prior to me going out on that stage is going to help besides breathing. You know what I mean? Like, without calling myself and centering myself to make sure that I'm in the correct mindset. So when I walk on stage, when I sit behind the piano, whenever I sing that first lyric, that it, it, that's that's the biggest takeaway. Um, one of the biggest takeaways that I've been able to hone in on, just on my performance career, just in general, and having that opportunity has helped me kind of, you know. Uh, round that out. Now it's not easy. Mm -hmm. Breathing, you know, is, as much as we believe, like we we naturally do it. But when you're in a high pressure situation, mm -hmm. calming your heart, calming your nerves, finding a way to self center is is one of the most difficult things to do. That's what I've coming. Uh, that's what I have experienced recently. Uh, is centering can be very difficult. Yeah. And if you don't do that, um, I learned. I have learned to do it daily and find ways to center, find ways to meditate, find ways to just take time to myself, mm -hmm. figure out what's going on. Yeah. And then I can then I can attack my day. Um, then I can attack whatever task is, is ahead of me, even working out, like getting in the gym. I have to psych myself up. Yeah. Uh, I know it's going to be good once I'm there, but it's getting to it. It's actually the journey um, to where we need, it was, yes, the process and uh, the journey getting to the destination is what I've had to find ways to mold, you know, take some time, love on that, you know what I mean? Because the journey is so beautiful. The journey is so beautiful. Like the destination is amazing, but getting there is we got to learn how to respect that and love on that as well. Mm -hmm. That's very powerful because I think some people look at an end goal and they're like, I want that. But it's like the journey that you're going to go through. Mm -hmm. It's so important to just, and you're right, take a deep breath because think of how many times, okay, obviously we're all breathing, right? And we do this all the time. But when you're upset, when you're excited, right? Like, like sometimes your heart pounds and you, you're, you know what I mean? And like, and you're, you don't really have control of your breath. So can you talk a little bit about centering yourself you said you meditate do you meditate every morning i try to uh -huh. um, i could be a lot more i could be so <laughs> intentional there are some mornings where i'm really intentional about it and then there's some mornings where i don't do uh what i'm supposed to do i don't do as good a job and i just kind of you know i kind of brush it off but when i actually take that time to center you know not pick up my phone it's so easy to just go pick up your phone and yeah. get the scroll and but you know we become numb to the fact that 
you know, th those are still outside voices that are outside of our being. And I think when we slow down and take that time to center, breathe, focus, we have an opportunity to really hone in and, like I said, self get get into who we really are and what we're supposed to be our purpose for that day and making the making the best of the day that's ahead of us or the task that's ahead of us um or even where we really should be you know what i mean like, you know, yeah. about emotions and anger and being super excited or super sad or um yeah. if we just find ways to get back to that place i feel like we could be in a much better place, you know what I mean? Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, taking that time to do that is it's helped me progress through so many different things. And so, you know, it's it's a learning experience for me. I, I'm not perfect at it at all. Uh, I don't always get it right. I'm far from always getting it right, but I can feel when I'm on the right track. I can feel that, oh, this this is what it feels like to lock in. This is what it feels like to actually center. Mm -hmm. And once you lock in with yourself, once you get in that groove, you, you're almost unstoppable. You're almost unstoppable. I, I always tell myself that, you know, I'm my big, I'm my biggest critic. You know, I stop myself from doing things most time before any other outside source can stop it. You know, mm -hmm. here it's out of my control. You know what I mean? But if I would have just woke up 15 minutes earlier, I may I might have been able to avoid the deal or avoid that accident or avoid whatever it is or whatever it could be. Um and so you know it's it's all about finding time and being intentional about it. Um mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing is being intentional about it and locking into it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think that brings me to my next point. Um, you you juggle so much as a musician and you're mm -hmm. doing so much all the time. How do you take care of your mental health? You know, it, it is. I know I mentioned earlier um, outside voices. Mm -hmm. um, ever, I think since the beginning of COVID, it was, it, it, I think it was mentally challenging for all of us. Mm -hmm. um, finding ways to be intentional about caring for our mental health. We were stuck inside the house. We didn't have, a, we didn't have much of a social life. Um, the, the most social life we had was on our phones because we were on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we had to FaceTime loved ones. And I think being in that situation, because I at the towards the end of the show, we morphed into this virtual globe. Like it was, it was, I hated it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. It was probably one of the most depressing, stressed out times I've I've ever seen being alive, you know what I mean? And um it it took a lot for me to you know really block out all of the outside noise social media i think it puts this um image in our head it yeah. it it feeds us constantly and if we're constantly looking at it and we're constantly uh, digesting it through our eyes through our ears it sometimes becomes our thoughts and it gets on the inside of us. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the biggest thing for me was being able to block all that stuff out. You know what I mean? Um, from the voice all the way up through where I am, where I am today, um, I've, I found myself relying less on social media. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even look at comments. I don't, look at um, thoughts of other people and opinions of other people as much as I used to. And during COVID, I think that became a normal for us. Right. Like we, we, we fed into people's opinions and what we were being fed in comparison to really taking time to really be intentional and focusing on ourselves, self-centering. 
mm-hmm. and meditating and, and, and finding that time to the ground and center. And um, that's one thing I realized in regards to my mental health that I had to be intentional about. I had to be intentional and I have to still be intentional about something as simple as reading a comment or something as simple as listening to someone's opinion um, or something as simple as being so closed off to the outside world to the only thing that I'm seeing is, you know, almost basically what's in my face. If I'm being completely honest, I absolutely hate social media. (laughs) Like I, if I could do without it, I promise you I would. I would live in a bubble and I wouldn't do it. I would not do it because there are so many different opinions and and uh, and things that feed into us that can eventually become poisonous if we don't watch it, if we don't, if we're not careful about it. And um, I've just found ways to take less time on there. I've fasted from it. I've deleted the apps from my phone where I won't even have access to it. People will. Ask, Appreciate you. I don't know what's going on. I, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I haven't seen it. Just tell me about it. I'm sure you can enlighten me. Like um, but I've been in that position, and I think that's been a good thing for me. Um, even as far as to, you know, like I said, as far as uh, the show where everybody's got things that they want to say about everybody, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Uh, everybody's opinions on what's going on in the world. I just tried not to feed into that. And um, I don't know if that applies more to my generation and maybe everybody that got locked up during COVID uh, in comparison to, you know, people like my parents where they don't necessarily rely so much on it. You know, so it kind of affected them that much. But for me, Facebook came out when I when I got into college. And so like that became, you know, cell phones went from being flip phones to tablets, little basically we had small tablets in our hands and we were able to scroll. So like times changed so quickly that, you know, it, it became a crutch for us. And um, I, I just think it became really important for me to um, develop a lifestyle that allowed me to better myself. I found I started to find things that I could um, that I could further elevate. So you know, I started to eat healthier. I started to work out a, a lot more. Um, I started to pray. I started to pray even more. I tried to increase um, my reading. I was reading books. I started to pick up self help books. Um, I started to. Um, have actual gatherings with friends because we forget how important that is because we're so we're so easy to you know pick up a phone and a text message is cool but to actually have an interaction with somebody that you truly care about you know have that one-on-one interaction all those things started to become important to me again um because we were losing people um and it, it was a scary time for us and so all of those things started to line up and um, I just, I, I, like I said, I became very intentional about my mental health and making sure that I kept my brain as clear as I could, my mind and focused on what was important and what was in front of me at the time. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, social media is good. It's bad. It's, but you ultimately need to do what works for you. And mm-hmm. I think, and I know people that have deleted the apps from their phone because it's just like, if it's there, you just click on it and then you're there for like two hours and you're like, but I could have been doing this. It could have been less, I could have been meditating or listening to a podcast or having yeah. lunch with someone. And I like what you said about meeting someone face to face. Cause I think so many people hide behind Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, people don't really have calls anymore. People don't have you like, when was the last time you called a friend of yours? Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's so true, and it's it, and it it's fulfilling to actually be able to do that. Like you know, yeah, to totally. call a friend, have a conversation, and that conversation you laugh harder than you have laughed in years just because you made a phone call, no Facetime call. You know, having that kind of interaction. I have family members. I grew closer with family members that lived in, that live in the northern states in Baltimore. Um, 
even more because we started to talk more. We started to FaceTime each other more because, it, like I said, it was a very uncertain time. We didn't we didn't know what was going to happen. And so I just, you know, it's, it's important to find those ways to do that and do things that make us feel good, you know, mm-hmm. um, in regards to paying attention to what really makes us feel at home, feel loved, feel like, you know, someone cares for us. And I think that was that was what was most important for me. I, I started to be around those people that poured into me, that started to uh, be able to give me what I was given out, you know, mm-hmm. or to be able to have that interaction. Like if, you're, if I'm constantly pouring out, I need to be around someone who can pour back into me as well. And so um, all those things, they, they, they ended up being very positive for me in the long run. Yeah. And it sucks that COVID had to bring those realizations, but I mm-hmm. like what you said about I'm pouring into this. Like, how is that person pouring into me? Cause I feel like sometimes we give people so much of ourselves mm-hmm. and then we're like, wait, but like that person isn't checking for me. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's eye opening and sometimes it sucks to lose those people, but then it gives you space to be with people who love you and support you and who just like really ride for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's so, that's so important. Like you need to have a squad. You got to have somebody on your team that's going to go to bat for you. And same, you know, if you need me to go to bat, I got my slugger. I'm ready. Like it, let's go. I'm ready because I got your back. And they got my back. And and it's important to have those people in your circle. So yeah. important. So important. So guys, if you're watching this and you have some people in your life that you just need to, you got to. You got to hit the, they got, you just, just cut him out. Cause it's just, you need to be around positivity and supportiveness and just, I mean, not everything's always rainbows and unicorns. It's just right. life, but just be with those people who love you and appreciate you and just be there for each other and you'll attract the right people. So powerful. I, I love this, Mike. I, I, I love this so much. <laughs> we knew this was going to be. <laughs> I knew. Yeah. I knew. I knew it was going to be like this. So yeah. let's talk about the musical you're in, When a Woman's Fed Up. Talk to me about the story and your role in it. Uh, so this is a hit stage play that has been touring the world for 20 years now. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have the opportunity to play Attorney Stone. I am playing uh, an attorney who is representing a guy who has gotten himself into an issue and um, well, two guys that are, that have gotten them to gotten themselves into issues. And uh, I'm actually, which is crazy. I'm actually taking over the role that Lenny Williams used to play. Mm -hmm. Lenny Williams, if anybody followed Tower Power, Lenny Williams was one of their first lead singers. And uh, he made Tower of Power famous. This time it's real. What is here? All that's Lenny. Don't change horses. All that's Lenny. Only so much oil. All that's Lenny. Anyway, I got a chance to uh, take his role. And um, we are touring. We've done Chicago. We've done Milwaukee. We've done um, what cities have we? What other cities have we done? Chicago, Milwaukee. Uh, well, I know we've got Washington, D.C. coming up. Um, We've, we've done, I've done another run before those two, and I'm losing it. Detroit, Detroit mm-hmm. and Cincinnati. That's it. All of this stuff is running together. <laughs> <laughs> it just, which city is next? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, and we got New York, we got New York on the list. And so, um, but I get an opportunity to play Lenny, not Lenny Williams, uh, Attorney Stone. And um, I am the hometown hero. I come to save the day. Uh, I'm very confident in my abilities to uh, represent these guys. And uh, I end up talking one guy off of the uh, out of his situation. I kind of help him out without giving too much of the storyline away. And uh, I'm having the opportunity to work with, um, let's see if I can recall the cast, uh, Patrice Lovely, um, Karan Joseph Riley, uh, Jennifer Holiday and um, uh, Terrell, I don't know his last name. Terrell, he, anyway, he's from Black Street. He's a very well-known singer from the R&B group uh, Black Street. 
And um, and I get I get to be in the circle with these people, these wonderful people, and we are hot right now. Like we are really on a roll. Um, we did. I went out and did a week of rehearsals. I memorized all my parts, and uh, I'm also in the band. So I play piano. I play keys in the band, and um, so I get an opportunity to be an attorney and the keyboard player of the show and learn all this music and accompany. Uh, Patrice, a company, Terrell, a company, uh, Jennifer Holiday, and it's a blast. Like it's a new thing for me. I think the last time I was on a stage prior to this was when I was doing the opera back at Columbus State University, and I was mm -hmm. in uh, L'Elysir d'Amore, which is translated to the Elixir of Love, and um, I had a, that was my first one of my well, I think that was my real first staged production, like where it include props, wardrobe changes, and interaction with other people on stage. Mm -hmm. And so having an opportunity to get back to this has been, it's been a wild ride. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's been a ride, but I have enjoyed every second um, being, like I said, being a part of the creative process and the production of it and setting the mood in these scenes. and. Um, seeing how all of this all of this goes together and mm -hmm. how it creates what the audience sees it's you know it's, it's it's really magical and so when we're in the city people you gotta come you just yeah. gotta, you gotta come see it for yourself yeah so do you know where you're gonna be next well we'll be in washington dc okay may 10 through the 12th mm -hmm. uh we got three shows if i'm not mistaken um friday or maybe it's no, I think it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm thinking about this weekend. So I, <laughs> no worries. You know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but he to come. <laughs> guys, if you're in DC, please check out yes. the show. Yes, 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 yes. May 10, May 10 through 12, we're at the Warner Theater. Okay. And so uh, I know they, they've got tickets for sale, and they've got a VIP special for sale uh vip special going on right now mm -hmm. so um but it's it's a it's a funny play uh patrice is a she's really funny um she's 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 uh she's a who all in herself and you just gotta see it a lot though i mean you know it's, it's just one of those things you gotta come in and you just gotta experience it the music is great um the acting is really good and so it's one of those things you just gotta come see it you you guys if he comes to your city, please see this musical. And where can they find out the dates and the tickets, like a specific website or where can they go? Yeah, I think it's uh, when a woman's fed up dot org. Okay. I, I, I have to uh, I'll have to confirm that. But if, if, if people are interested, I know that the tickets are available on Ticketmaster. Mm -hmm. um, so if they type when a woman's fed up in Ticketmaster, those tickets should come up and they should have the dates. I know Brooklyn is on the schedule for June or they're preparing for it. I hope I'm not speaking too prematurely on that. Um, <laughs> but the last I heard, Brooklyn was on the schedule. Uh, I'm not entirely sure of the location just yet. Um, and I'm, I don't want to misspeak the date. Okay. So Brooklyn is on there. May 10 through 12 is on and, um, we are coming back down south. So for everybody that's been asking me, are we coming closer to the south? Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. uh, that's our herd. So they just gotta be on the lookout. They can follow me on Instagram. I'm always posting uh, drops for that and promos for that. And we're, we're, we're getting the promo and getting the gas and the ammo for that as well. Yeah. So um, that's, a lot, that's a lot happening right now. Yeah, Mike is a busy guy, and I'm so very excited that you came back on my show, Mike, because this has been a long time in the making, and I'm so grateful for your time. And please come back on the show soon. I know you have, I mean, I honestly think we'd go for like another three or four hours, but I'm not going to do that to you or my audience. But <laughs> let's let's do this again sometime. Yes. Anytime you want to come out and promote stuff, I know that there's new music coming up. So mm -hmm. I feel like we only touch the surface with some of this stuff and definitely come back and we will rock out some more. You know, we got to Ashley. I'll be uh, more than happy to do that. And always thank you for having me. And I'm so grateful for what you do for us out here. And I know that it 
probably is not appreciated enough, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Seriously. You're so very welcome, Mike. I, I do this show for people like you because there's so much amazing talent and I'm so very excited when I have a beautiful conversation with someone and it's even more exciting when I can invite them back a second or third or fourth time because it just reaffirms what I'm doing and I've already built that trust with you guys. So you guys want to come back in and chill with me. Yes. Uh, look, I'm I'm on this show every time you call and I can make it happen and this is my schedule. I'm coming back. No questions. Asked. You're the best. You're the best. Mike, I truly appreciate you and your time and your artistry. And I'm so excited to be on this journey with you. Before I let you go, any final words for the room? Look, um, believe in yourself to anybody out there that's doubting. Um, trust yourself. Trust that intuition. And don't stop moving. Keep moving forward. Yeah. Forward progression. And even if there's a little bump in the road, treat it as a life lesson and learn from it. Mic drop. I don't even know if I could say anything after that. So beautifully said. And you dropped a lot of gems tonight. And I feel like the people who are watching this currently or watch it on replay, it's going to give them a lot to think about. There's a lot of positivity in this. So thank you, Mike, for your time and your wisdom and your artistry. And I hope to see you sooner rather than later. Yes, yes. We got to make it happen. Ashley. Of course. So guys, if you don't already, please make sure to follow Mike. He has a lot of amazing things happening now and coming down the road. And if you're new here, I'm Ashley Live. This is Vibe with Ashley Live. Guys, hit that like button, hit subscribe. And Mike was on episode, I think it was 38. It was back in 2021. So Mike has been on this show. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so he's going to come back on again. But yes. thank you guys so much for rocking with us. Mike, so very appreciative of your time. And have a beautiful evening. Thanks, you too. Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye. Peace.